You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing. You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about sports in the state of Michigan? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, the show that provides research and statistics about all the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no slappiness, no coddling, no pop culture, no conspiracy theories, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Head over to our website at michigansportstruth.weebly.com Follow us on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Michigan underscore truth. And like and share our verified Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Also listen to us on Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts via iTunes, Google Play on its podcast mobile app, and Spotify. Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. And welcome to episode 337 of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Spreaker, live on Spreaker. I'm Taylor Phillips along with Ed Smith. Buck Gina will join us a little bit later on. He's still at his meeting. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips and Instagram at DT2Phillips. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter and Instagram at EdSmith313. And follow Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the third. Three eyes for Roman numerals. Um, got a real good special report to um, get across. Also, we have some football to recap and preview plus the Red Wings to recap and preview as they start their season on a low note. And we have the Pistons to preview because they're coming up next. They're in their preseason playing form right now, but, but they're not look but they're not looking good. Pending what I saw last night at home against the Brooklyn Nets, their defense still needs a lot of work, but we'll get to that later on. But first, our very hot top, hot top story here. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this special report. That one is long gone. Yeah! Yep. Tigers television commentators Mario and Pemba and Rod Allen have been fired for their physical altercation that transpired either August or September. That's that's kind of what I remember. Reported by Anthony Fennick, who jumped on it first. A source told Anthony Fennick of the Detroit Free Press that Mario and Pemba and Rod Allen will not return to the broadcast booth on Fox Sports Detroit for the 2019 season. From what I've been told from the Detroit Sports Rag group, one of the DSR followers, is their contracts expire actually this year. But um, good rinse to uh, Rod Allen especially, but uh, Mario and Pemba apparently, uh, to, to most people, did not do a thing. But from this may surprise you. From what I've read... in a comment on YouTube that Mario and Pemba was sitting in Rod Allen's chair and he flagellated on it. That, that's, I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody actually commented on one of those local four videos on YouTube about him, Pemba and Allen duking it out in the booth off the air.
but um, this is uh, this is a very it, it, it was a that was this is a very big story. It, it was a matter of time while we as we waited, but uh, now we get word that not only will we will we not see Rod Allen, which is which is a which is um, inevitable. We won't even see Mario and Pemba see or hear Mario and Pemba in the booth either, which which uh, kind of shocks me as a as a public relations specialist, but really, as I detect this, as much truth as I can, or at least some rumor or speculation or whatever, it's not as surprising. So, um, it's, so Ed, very, very breaking news. Um, it's, this is, uh, a blessing for, uh, Tigers fans who, uh, don't want to hear any BS from Mario or Rod Allen. I'm sure they, they welcome this news uh, with absolute open arms and a few little with some cheering as well. Um, I myself didn't mind the two of them, the way they operated, how they worked. Um, if they had offered a little bit more criticism when it was warranted, it would have been uh, made them more favorable in my eyes. But uh, that really, I, but I could understand why those did have a problem with those two, especially particularly Rod Allen. Um, but even still, um, it was quite abrupt as to how uh, this whole partnership and tenureship and everything else did. Think about for, for Mario and Pemba too, for how you know he from building such a long, substantial uh, tenure at Fox Sports Detroit uh, for what going on two decades and not past two decades, uh, two decades already, and. He just throws it all away in the blink of an eye. So uh, it's the reports are, are are stating that yeah, this is the last year of the contract anyway. But I think that was just um, I, I, this is more. I would doubt that's more than some type of convenience. Um, the network was embarrassed as to how they were their two representatives acted uh, and it made national news beyond local news. So uh, repercut the proper repercussions had to be taken and if it meant that both men losing their jobs that I think that's a fair decision because both guys uh, played their hands and it's coming about so both guys deserve to pay the price yeah yeah and um, we have some we have a couple questions um, to save for later in our five question segment but um, yeah very big news, but uh, it was inevitable anyway. Even though Mario and Pemba didn't do anything, he would still be involved in the fight, and uh, and even even they had to do business anyway, just just to make sure house was cleaned. And uh, it it was time for uh, it was time for more. Truth, it's time for more truth telling at Fox Sports Detroit booth with with uh, Kirk Gibson. If if he's willing to uh, do color commentary full time, even with Parkinson's disease, think about think about that. That's a, that's going to be another one of our five questions. An, another question would be who would replace who would replace uh, Mario and Pemba. But we'll answer those later on. So, um, yeah, we'll just we'll just move on from there. Um, we also heard that Jose Iglesias is no longer on the Tigers roster, and this this kind of shocks me because I didn't hear any news from any legitimate media source. But um, I guess that's that for yeah, Jose Iglesias. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, if, if it is, it'll be a very befuddling way as to why uh, this happened out of nowhere, it seems. You know, you have to find out what's the reason, what's the motive, what logic, if, if there is there, um, would be behind making this kind of decision if it were to turn out to be true. Now, it's been out there, this, this tweet supposedly uh, about uh, stating of Iglesias no longer being with the team. It's been circulating now for about a couple of days, but yet none of it has gotten any type of sniff 
many of the local media or any of the national media. I mean, with the Tigers, you know, releasing or cutting their starting shortstop, you would think that would make some type of headline uh, attention grab. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, if there's some smoke, there could be some fire because there are some, uh, some apparent, uh, evidence that Jose Iglesias did in fact play his last game as a Tiger. Apparently there is, if you search out, search his name on Twitter, you get some results about him apparently posting, making a post to Instagram, uh, giving a thank you to Tigers fans, the, you know, long story short, essentially calling it a farewell post, stating this will be his last season with the Tigers, and apparently he, like, what, deleted the post very shortly after, but uh, we'll see, we'll see uh, how, how that develops, but um, whatever, there's smoke, there is fire. Yeah, and then uh, I heard from an article, I read an article from Jason Beck, one of his mail mailbag blogs on uh, mailbag articles on MLB.com Jason Beck, the Tigers beat writer for MLB.com that Miguel Cabrera might be uh, a part-time designated hitter starting in 2019 now Jason Beck did not mention or talk about who he might platoon the DH role with but I'm guessing it's gonna be gonna have to be Nick Castellanos if if that's gonna be the case. Nick Castellanos, keep in mind, is a very very incredible hitter, but he's terrible defensively. Whether it's at third base or right field or any position on the out out there on the on the field, whether it's infield or outfield. Your thoughts. considering the fact that his body has been starting to break down more and more um, the past few seasons since he signed his contract extension, um, cutting his season shorter and shorter for a myriad of reasons. Um, eventually, you kind of figured this kind of day would come, so it doesn't surprise me. Now, the thing is, we, we got to see how we're going to make that transition. We can't just do it uh, just like a, like a quick flash, you know what I mean? Because... Um, they tried that before when, you know, when they tried switching to third base, and then that turned out to be a disaster. So, um, or at least, you know, until Prince Fielder was gone. So, uh, it would be interesting to see how they transitioned him to this different role this time around, but I do think it's the right move to make when you consider how Mick is getting up there. This is what is 15th or 14th season's been in the, in the league for 15 years. I mean, he was a rookie in 2003 when he won the, the World Series with the Marlins. That should tell you how long he's been playing in this game. So, uh, with Cabrera, it's just a matter of time of uh, when, you know, everything will catch up to the point where he may, he'll be um, virtually ineffective. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's part of the game. You know, it's part of father time and all that. So, um, while you're the Tigers, I would suggest... You know, if you could find uh, either a good scout or a good draft pick in terms of finding that next potential first baseman down the line, unless you don't have one already in your farm system, I would suggest start looking for one right now because, you know, sooner or later, rather than later, I believe you're going to need a full time replacement for Miguel Cabrera. Yeah. Let's. Yeah. Yeah, Miguel Cabrera, Nick Castellanos, that wouldn't be bad. So, Castellanos wouldn't be bad, and it, and it takes him out of, out of the defense. So, because uh, it's defense is real shoddy at best. Yeah, the question is uh, who would who would play right field if Nick Castellanos were to DH? That's out of the five question segments, so we can answer that right now if you want to. Yeah, um, first and foremost, like, what's the current depth? Because I think, I know Jacoby Jones is out there, but he's already, he'll be more considered the center fielder, am I right? Or is he more versatile than that? Jacoby Jones is a left fielder. Leonis Martin is the center fielder. 
There's also Mikey. Yeah, there's also Mikey Matuk that that could take um, take the right field position. He's played uh, left field and right field before. Mm, versatility, but it doesn't mean he will be effective uh, either way. But still, you might have no other choice concerning. Um, that's all you have in terms of depth at that spot position. Boy, I'm sure it was all worth it losing J.D. Martinez. <laughs> boy, oh boy, is right. Yeah. That's, um, yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, J.D. Martinez, uh, just helping the Boston Red Sox blow past the New York Yankees in the American League Division Series. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, not to mention with Rick Porcello as well. So enjoy that salt even further, Tigers fans. Yeah, absolutely. Let me check the score real quick. I'm pretty sure the Red Sox are going to... Yep, they lead the Boston Red Sox. Uh, they lead the New York Yankees right now 4-1 to one in Game 4 of the ALDS. Top of the eight, two out. Runners on second and third. Batanzi's on the mound. Mookie bets. At bat, 0 for 4, 188 average. The Red Sox scored three and runs so in the they, third. It's on TV. So if they win this one, they'll move on to the LCS to face the Astros. So, yeah. Uh, by the way, even uh, another reminder for Tigers fans: Justin Verlander is there too with the Astros, coming off of winning his first World Series last year with the Astros. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry to remind you, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, absolutely. I'm pretty sure at least some of those Tiger fans out there would know already. And they, and even they would know that the Tigers had no choice but to sell him last year, last calendar year. And that's... Uh, yeah, they had to. Otherwise, he'd be in, in, in as much of a miserable spot as everyone else is right now. Yeah. Not to mention we're probably a little, with a more broken down body. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, with that being said here, let me see if I can dig up that music bed here. I will say, though, at least it's, it's a good thing this train wreck of a season finally came to an end. We didn't get 100 losses, but still, we almost got a surely a top five draft pick, so yeah. that'll help us build with the future. Remember, USA Today projected them to, to lose 99 games. They lost 98, just one damn game short of that prediction. Just one game. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess they wanted to make Victor Martinez the last game of Comerica feel special, but yeah, it wasn't worth it. Right. Right. It, that Even that was me- meaningless. But but that's but that's why Miggy, either Miggy or Nick Castellanos would take the DH spot or they could platoon. Yep. That's right. So, with all that being gotten out of the way, let's transition to college football. Touchdown, Michigan! Well, the Michigan Wolverines uh, let the Maryland Terrapins hang around for a little bit before pulling away with a 42-21 win at the Big House. Ed, your analysis. Yeah, well, there is a lot to cover considering this game. First and foremost, you know, just look to start with the opposite. Uh, there was a a bit over an hour of a delay to the start of, of kickoff because of lightning strikes in the area. So we had to go through a weather delay, uh, which meant, of course, uh, we had to waste, wait at least an hour or so before there was any update. And, of course, no other cell passed through the area, so they were able to get the kickoff right then and there. Now, um, if you had to wonder how it would affect both teams in terms of uh, different from being a middle-of-the-game weather delay as opposed to a middle, you know, a delay during the pregame, so as, you know, it, how, how it would affect you getting warm and stuff and uh, getting things all properly set up, but still, uh, Michigan was able to come out, utilize the fact that uh, um, they could run the ball very well against practically anyone um, uh, that they have played in this weaker portion of their schedule, and for good reason, they needed to do that to show that they're capable of doing so. Uh, give them a little bit of confidence also before they head the, to the meat and potatoes of their schedule. Um, in terms of their running back by committee, of course, Karan Higdon getting uh, the bulk of the load, the workhorse of the offense, 
Uh, he had about what twenty five yard twenty five carries for over hundred yards. Um, he's well on pace to be getting up to uh, over over a thousand yards rushing uh, for the season. He was on track to do it last year, but he had a, uh, an ankle injury that he suffered, which conveniently was against Maryland. So uh, nice little demon for Karan to get get past in this game as he uh, continues marching on. Now, uh, with other things besides, besides that, you know, it was worth noting with Higdon. Uh, having his fair share of injuries this season, that Chris Evans, Chris Evans was able to step in and help contribute. Uh, this this week it was the other way around. Evans, you know, he was not feeling quite up to task and decided to sit this one out. Luckily, though, we had True, Will, True Wilson was able to come in, and it was next man up, and he more than adequately performed. And in terms of our depth beyond injuries, not you know, it's on both sides of the ball, but especially on offense, um, you can have. Karan Higdon may not be feeling well, or Chris Evans may not be feeling well. You have a true Wilson right behind you to help carry the load. Um, you could lose uh, your potential, your projected top star into Britt Black, and have multiple transfers from Eddie McDoom to Kikoa Crawford and whatnot, um, but still have a very uh, productive receiving core who now has more touchdown catches uh, at the halfway point of the season than they did all of last year. Um, you know, with the likes of Nico Collins, Donovan Peoples-Jones, and experienced guys like Grant Perry as well. Um, you know, it's quite impressive to see that they, along with their new quarterback, Shea Patterson, are meshing more and more. And in terms of Patterson's development, yes, he did have another interception. But in terms of how I see him moving around the pocket, he's showing more patience. He's not showing uh, 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 more happy feet. He's being more... Uh, patient and, and waiting for the play to develop. Uh, of course, he's not holding it too long, but it, it gives the offensive line a good chance to protect him well enough with the play uh, draw out. And in terms of what Harbaugh and the offensive coaches are doing in terms of play calling, I see there are mixing in more of a balance of uh, showcasing Shea in his more comfortable state with shotgun and read option and, and handing off and, and that sort of thing and play action pass. But also, you know, they still try to establish the fact that, hey, you know, we're in the Big Ten, we'll be a power run team, you know, and they have the right formation and, and the right players to do that. You know, this where uh, they don't, it, it doesn't come across as forcing it. They can run well with Karate, but they can run well with True Wilson, they can run well with Chris Evans, they can even run well with, with Ben Mason, uh, who's starting to get some notoriety as well. Uh, yeah. Or being a fullback, that's that's quite a, becoming a rare commodity these days in football for both uh, uh, college and pro. You know, essentially a, a throwback to the old days of the golf stops and the Corey Schlesinger's of the world. Uh, seeing those those hard nosed fullbacks either showcasing good blocks or just getting the ball right up the middle to get you those those big yards near the goal line. Um, and Ben Mason is showcasing his skill at that, at that and then some. Not only that, but uh, excuse me, you know, when you see other depth players at that spot, uh, Jared Wagner, the backup fullback, who caught a touchdown uh, near the end of the game, they'll saw it away. Uh, the fact that you're seeing Nico Collins becoming more and more of a deep threat to where it's, it's just, you know, you feel more confident whenever Patterson throws a deep ball down the field, uh, you have a good feeling that it's going to be, be caught by Collins as opposed to it was earlier in the season. Um, our offense, I, I like, I do like the fact that, uh, we're starting to capitalize more, get more touchdowns. And not only that, but also when the time is needed, have more, you know, four minute drives, five minute drives that waste time, you know, milk clock, keep the defense uh, fresh and refreshed, you know, so they can go and dominate, do what they need to do, and then punching it, you know, with a touchdown that helps steal the game away. That's what we saw on one of those last offensive drives with uh, Higdon feeling a little worn down. Who Wilson got the load, and he more than filled his role and helps set the tone for that game to a touchdown. And you, you you got guys like Ronnie Bell and Jared Wang uh, catching touchdowns, you know, 50 seniors catching touchdowns and, and helping contribute as well. So it's nice to see the offense working out more of the kinks that they had from last season, even in, and even against Notre Dame uh, earlier in the year and work it out more and more. But now, as we see here, the cupcake portion of the schedule is now done, um, and now it, it 
comes to the part of this is quite essentially the make it or break your portion of your schedule of your season right here. And it starts what was a big night game, prime time game coming up against Wisconsin this Saturday, followed up with a noon kickoff against Michigan State. And then I would assume another big primetime showcase, whether it be late afternoon or even another night game against Penn State. I would say on Fox, since uh, ABC is given the Michigan-Wisconsin game, so uh, to, considering how Penn State keeps winning and looking impressive, that would be another uh, big uh, big test for Wolverines, big top-ranked uh, game uh, coming up soon for them. So uh, between that, and even though Michigan State has obviously fallen off, we'll get to them in a bit. This is a good chance for Michigan to solidify themselves as a potential playoff contender. Uh, because when you look at the fact that their only loss was on the road at night to a Notre Dame team that looks like a certified, you know, one of the best four teams in the country, and that loss was only on seven by seven digits with the chance to tie the game up with. with uh, with that line, with that last drive of two minutes to go, it puts things, it puts, really puts things into consideration as to how Michigan may be a potential playoff team this year. Not still. They gotta make a lot of adjustments. They still have a lot of things ahead that they gotta cross that one inch at a time. They gotta do, can they get, they gotta get through this tough three game stretch first. They'll rest up easy with some easy games after, afterwards. You know, you got a Rutgers here. You know, that, that always helps out. But then again, but then of course you got Ohio State at the end. So if you were to somehow get by this three game stretch as seven and two, or dare I say eight and one, you probably start feeling yourself a little bit, but be careful because if you walk in with that Conor McGregor like cockiness, you will then be walking into a trap against the Yeah, absolutely. So, um, speaking of Michigan State... Touchdown, MSU! Ah! You are pathetic! Ah! You blew it! Michigan State, the Spartans blow their game against the Northwestern Wildcats, 29-19. At Spartan Stadium on homecoming? Are you kidding me? Oh, that, oh, wait, that's right. Dave Warner, the worst play caller in college football history, in my view. Oh, my God. You are pathetic! I, I never thought I, I would see the day where someone could actually be worse than Dan Rorschach. But, my God, we've, we've actually found one. We found a guy who is somehow taking an antiquated scheme uh, from years and years and years ago, it tried to apply it to more modern day football, and it's combined with a conservative head coach who, because he's friends with the guy and likes to be loyal, can't find the gallstones to let him know, hey, this is not working out for the team, working out for the program, I'm going to have to let you go, we're going to move in a different direction. No, 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 Mark likes his buddy, so it's, it's okay. It's, this is the same problem that, above all else, in my opinion, led to John L. Smith get, well, one of the top two reasons that led to John L. Smith losing his job, that and his inability to win big games. Um, you know, between that, it was just, oh my goodness, it, it made this season, which already felt rockety, uh, rickety from, from a standpoint of, wow, you barely scraped by Utah State, you lost to Arizona State, you know, and you, Indiana gave you another scare. So with this loss to a Northwestern team, uh, a 1-3 a, a Northwestern team on the surface looks horrible. Let's give some credit out to Northwestern first about what they did. Because remember, this is the same Northwestern team that had Michigan on the ropes last week in their own backyard. Uh, well, you know, in, in, in Evanston. So for them to come on the road uh, the very next week after blowing that big lead and completely handle Michigan State the way they did was quite impressive. Minute Northwestern is much better than what their record indicates. That they keep this up, they're going to prove it to be a formidable bowl team, uh, which would make Michigan's resume look even better, by the way. Um, but back to the point of, of the 
Dave Warner and the, co- and the coaching and the play calling. I'm like, my goodness, what are you doing with swing passes uh, when you're down by a touchdown you need to move the ball downfield? And for that matter, what in the heck are you doing not having Felton Davis, who is clearly your best offensive weapon in the game in the fourth quarter, getting valuable snaps? Like, really? So, that, that, that would be like, my goodness, that would have been like uh, the Lions not finding a way to have Calvin Johnson in the game um, so that he could get valuable snaps during during his prime. So, it, it's, it's, it's a lofty hyperbole of, of comparison, but you get the gist. You know, the, the Spartans are not using their best player in the most crucial quarter. Why is that? And how in the world do you let a team who somehow managed to get a grand total of eight, eight rushing yards, and they still beat you at your place by double digits? Oh, maybe because you do things like going for fourth and one and deep in your own territory with two timeouts left against a stacked box. So, Michigan yeah. State really has no one else to blame for themselves for this. It is embarrassing how they let this season completely fall off the tracks. And quite frankly, with Penn State coming up this week and Michigan next week, things may get a whole lot uglier. The Spartans uh, are going to play at Happy Valley. The Spartans are going to play at Happy Valley next week, this this upcoming Sunday, actually, upcoming Saturday. It's at 3.30 on BTN. The Spartans and the Nittany Lions. Let's get to those college football in the mitten quick picks, shall we? Absolutely. Time now for the college football in the mitten quick picks. First off, we your Michigan Wolverines against the Wisconsin Badgers. 7.30 on ABC. Wow. This is a home night game. Um, from what I can tell, it is not going to rain uh, this Saturday night. Thank goodness, because that morning well, evening was such a bother. Don't, last year please, don't pull a Bra- State, so. please don't pull a Bra- Braylon Edwards, please. It, that's, it, it can go both ways, so that's canceled out. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, but even still, like the, the, the fact that we won't even see that type of, of, of weather makes both sides happy, trust me. Um, right, yeah. Uh, in addition to that, you do have a Wisconsin team that has looked very weak or, or weaker than, than what their uh, preseason ranking said they were to be coming into in, in, into uh, the season. So what they've done in recent weeks, it's made them look more vulnerable, in my opinion. And the fact that, you know, you have a Nebraska team that Michigan just dumped, by the way. Mm-hmm. This Nebraska team somehow, what, threw over 400 yards passing against this Wisconsin defense? Wow. Yeah, exactly. That gives that would that give you confidence in the Michigan fan that, hey, you know what? Jim Ashley can have himself a nice game here as long as he keeps down the turnovers, keeps his patience, and, uh, this, you know, just make play, sure that play better defense. Yeah. Well, if he extends the play, just don't be too reckless. You know what your defense is going to bring. You know what they're going to do. Um, more than likely, they'll have Rashawn Gary back. Uh, Blue Mafor, uh, I think they'll have him back as well. Um, Devin Bush, as long as he doesn't get himself ejected. And same thing with Hudson. As long as those two guys are in there, you know what Chase Winovich is going to bring. Yeah, here's another um, key. Play more disciplined. Yeah, yeah, that was one thing that, that has been thought that's been their Achilles heel if, for, for their defense. Um, if they're, I mean, that granted, they are aggressive, but sometimes that can be to a fault. Uh, Devin Bush, like I said, with the rough of the pass penalty that he had, almost getting another targeting call. Um, you know, it happens. And when you play press coverage the way Michigan does, sometimes you're going to get called for those fast interferences. Uh, that's why you have such reliance on your front seven and your D-line getting home to the quarterback first that, yes, even though you may have good players in the secondary, as long as the quarterback is disrupted, you don't have to worry so much about those secondary penalties um, and other sorts of things. But still, Michigan has got to do a much better job being more disciplined, uh, not losing that edge, but being more smarter with it. Yeah, so... so in terms of what the game's going to look like, I think I'm saying Michigan's going to win. Uh, the line opened up as Michigan's six and a half point favorite is now moved to seven and a half point favorite. Um, 
Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, in terms of their last 33 or so Big Ten road games, they've all been decided by one score, I believe. So if Michigan were to win, it would be very surprising if they win by, by 10, by double digits. So my score prediction is going to be Michigan 21, Wisconsin 17. I'm going to be more fair here and get in between single digits and double digits or between one possession and two possessions. How about a nine-point victory for Michigan? How about 33-24? to 24? Mm. Yeah, just, just to make it fair. That's a lot of points scored. I mean... Granted, they they put up that kind of points, but you know against the past few teams. But remember, you know SMU and Nebraska, or, or, or even Maryland, they are no Wisconsin, they're no Penn State, and well, they made it better than Michigan State, but they're certainly no Ohio State. So it'd be interesting to see. Remember the last time this offense faced any sort of legitimate defense, uh, they had their troubles against Notre Dame. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see how they do this time around against legit defense in Wisconsin. Or legit enough defense. I'll, I'll, I have a second. I have a second pick. 25-16 Michigan. Mm. Probably more low scoring. I, it seems like what these two teams get together is always low scoring. So it wouldn't surprise me if this is another low scoring affair. There you go. So I'll go with 25-16. Yep. And Michigan State at Penn State. 3-30 BTN as I mentioned before. Uh, oh, I, God. Let me pe- let me pick first. I'll pick Penn State to win. Uh, let me let me let me be fair here and say thirty five or thirty eight to seventeen. Yeah, they're not, they're, Penn State's they're going to show no mercy. Thirty eight to three. Oh, thirty eight to three. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in Happy Valley. Yeah. And, and they just went through that that heartbreak at at, at, at Ohio against Ohio State. Yeah, they're going to be PO'd. They're going to be looking to make an example of someone. Michigan State. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry for that. You. Was a hell of a game between the Buckeyes and the Nittany Lions. I saw that last night. But the Buckeyes never underestimate them. They came out on top. They found a way to win with their offense, especially Dwayne Haskins. That's another guy to that's another guy to look out for for OSU. Yeah, Haskins is going to be a real. A uh, real trick to deal with when it, when it comes time to face them in November. Any quarterback is a trick for for Ohio State. You know why? Because their players are developed well, like they always have been. Uh, that like is it or not, the thing you got to give them credit for it is that they find a way to develop their quarterbacks to play at their at the top level for college. Not necessarily it panners out well in the NFL, but still for, for the Big Ten and in the college in the college ball. Um, they do their job well enough to where they're playing for and winning championships. Absolutely. Whether it be yeah. Urban Meyer or Jim Tressel being yeah. the head coach, any head coach, even even Woody Hayes before he was fired when he threw that punch at that Clemson player a long time ago. But everybody knows that. So that's college football in the minute. Quick picks. Now we transition to pro football. Touchdown! Man, oh man, the Lions actually beat the Packers 31-23, and that was in a game where Packers kicker Mason Crosby missed four field goals and an extra point. Ah, You are pathetic! Yeah, that was really one of the weirdest games I've ever seen, in addition to the Mason Crosby uh, spectacular adventure. uh, We also saw the coming out party of Kenny Galladay, um, we yep. also saw Big uh, a very, you know, uh, a roller coaster of a game from Aaron Rodgers. He had about, what, 400 yards passing, but he had a couple big fumble turnovers. He also was trying to lead. The Those were four turnovers point. from what I could see. Yeah, but yeah, good, great pressure but, by, by the defense, but still it goes as his mark against Rodgers. But still, credit to the Lions defense for actually doing that. Um, and the reason he, you know, why it shows 400 yards because, you know, Rogers was doing was essentially throwing every down to help get this team back in, uh, into contention. You know, it's something Stafford does on a regular basis, or what Drew Brees does, and, and that and, and that's really to establish the lead and beat you. Period. Um, so it didn't surprise me to see Rogers had that amount of yards. I don't think he looked that impressive. I still think that 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 injury, that leg, is bothering him a bit. Even though he's getting better week by week, but still, you can tell it's hampering him still a little bit. Um, so that helped the Lions out for this week. I don't know what's going to do for them when they we, we, we meet up again week 17 in Lambeau. Uh, but it will still be interesting to see. Um, in terms of the 
sense of Mason Crosby missing those kicks, listen, he's been a vet and a veteran in the league for a long, long time. He's been with the Packers for a long time as well. So because he has that seniority with Green Bay, uh, that's the reason why he was cut uh, early Monday morning. That's the reason even why that you know, Mike McCarthy gave another shot uh, to, to, to bring out that kick, that field goal, which I like that move, you know, help him establish his confidence any type of way. So when he brought him up that uh, for that field goal to make it a one possession game, uh, it was the right move. So I uh, got no props on that. Uh, there's one area of concern, though, it would be the injuries that they've been suffering through. Um, Ziggy Alpha, again, missing another game. I don't know if it's because of an injury issue or it could be some related to his contract issue. If that question was brought up to Matt Patricia um, in, in a press conference earlier this week. He really did not feel like answering that question in any way, shape, or form. So it'll be interesting to see what's going on behind the scenes with that scenario, with that issue. Um, other injuries that may be of concern, T.J. Lang missing this game with lingering concussion effects. Um, that's one of you know, your key guys you need for that offensive line to move as well as it did against New England in terms of getting on Johnson uh, more holes to have great uh, rushing rushing games and rushing days for speaking of carry on he pulled his ankle uh, or he had a little bit of a sprain of his ankle or his leg I think it was either late third or early fourth that kept him out the rest of the way um, so that'll be of one area of concern you'll pay attention to uh, so those are the big interests I could think of at the moment that um, should be on the radar for Lions fans but um, other than that it, it was just you know it was a good it was a good feeling to get a win and to beat the Packers for one. You know, say what you want about how they look or how Green Bay may look or whatever the case may be, or Rodgers wasn't 100%. You found a way to beat the Packers at home, and you look good doing it for the most part. So if, there, if there's any way you can keep up, your, keep up your momentum, I'm all for it. Especially when after the, the horrific way you started this season, for you to somehow end up 2-3, and three, um, it's, it's, a, it's astonishing. Yeah, and uh, let me add up, let me do a little scoreboard math here, some simple scoreboard math. Mason Crosby missed four field goals and one extra point. As I mentioned before, that's a total of 13 points missed. And the Lions won by eight. They could have lost by five. Yeah, there's no question he single-handedly was the difference maker uh, one way or another in this game. But if you're a Lions fan, you're not, you don't apologize for that win. You take it any way you can get it. Yeah, absolutely. They have a bye week, and then they're at the Miami Dolphins, who have lost two straight, obviously. But then again, that but then again, that's just the Miami Dolphins after starting three and zero, which is uh, very very uncharacteristic. That's on Sunday, October twenty first, Blackjack on on Fox at one o'clock on Fox two in Detroit and local thirty two in Cadillac, Fox seventeen in Grand Rapids. Fox 47 in Lansing. And what? Um, don't they have, after that, don't they face the Seahawks at home next, or do they face someone else? They, oh, a, after the Dolphins, you mean? Yeah, after, after Miami, yeah. Yeah, let me check. You're listening to episode 337 of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Don't forget the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast is launching on the Stables Network next Wednesday, October 17th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Blog Talk Radio. Our special thanks go to Mark Mancini of the Stables Network for giving us a chance. Both you and I will be on the air, yours truly and Ed Smith, and we'll have Jeff Moss of the Detroit Sports Rag, at least hopefully, as a frequent guest. We're tra- as well as many others. Yep, like Urinating Tree, Five Points Vids, Buck Gino, Prashant Dyer, it could be anyone of our choice. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that being said, yep, yeah. they are they are home against the Seahawks in Week Eight on October twenty eighth. The Seahawks are two and three. Can you believe that? That could be a pivotal game. That could be a pivotal game in terms of establishing, uh, you know, how tiebreakers go in terms of uh, locking up one of those final wild card spots if it comes down to it. Yeah, never underestimate Pete Carroll, though. Yeah, true, but, you know, you also always tell the fact that he'll do something to put you in a good position to win the game. See Super Bowl, see Rose Bowl 2006. 
Right, with USC. We remember that very well with the USC Trojans. So, we'll preview the Miami Dolphins on the Staples Network next Wednesday when we get to our uh, football segment, our Lions football segment. But for now, the Red Wings start their regular season 0-1-2 with a 3-2 overtime loss to the Columbus Blue Jackets in their season opener at at the crappy pizza pile called Little Caesars Arena. Then they go out west. They lose in regulation to the LA Kings 4-2, and then they lose in a shootout to the Anaheim Ducks 3-2 at Honda Center. So uh, people can brag about the two points that they got. They, they, still don't have, they still don't have a win. They're home against the Toronto Maple Leafs Thursday at 7.30. Then they go out east on a road trip. At Boston, Saturday at 7, Montreal on Monday, Tampa Bay a week from Thursday, and then Florida Panthers at BB&T Center Saturday on the 20th at 7. But uh, this is this is uh, a kind of a, a kind of a start um, that that we kind of wanted. The Red Wings still don't have a win, and that's uh, a, that's still the main part of a tanking process, you know. So that, that there's there's nothing to see there. It's just the same old Red Wings. Yeah, I mean there are some things to see in terms of how the young the young rookies and the other young players will do. Yeah, Dennis uh, Chalowski. Chalowski got a goal. Yes, he got a goal. Good for him. Um, oh, man. Samantha looked pretty good. Uh, Anthony Steele obviously looks great. Um, Marcus as well. Um, their defense, when you consider the fact that their normal guys are borderline screw-ups these days and Cronwell and Erickson and they're hurting it to start the year. That let, that should really let you know of how uh, their depth or lack thereof really is at, de- at, at defenseman. So uh, that of course is going to lead to more shoddy defense as we saw uh, in that uh, in against uh, the Blue Jacks, particularly in that opening period where you know they gave up so many shooting and scoring up opportunities and, and scoring chances um, to where, what, they had they'd given up either through the first period or through the second two periods, they gave only 40 shots uh, to them themselves, almost getting 20. Well, it was one of these games, but still, it, it showcases of how, um, how lacking they are on, on the defensive side of things. And also another thing that, that's showing uh, some so genuine concern to me is their goaltending. Um, Jimmy Howard is really starting to showcase signs of, of either he doesn't, uh, you know, either he's losing some quickness, losing some reflex speed, or it could be potential of, you know, at some point he may, you may need to change the scenery for him one way or another. Uh, it, it, it's just not working out. It's starting to showcase uh, to where he's not going to be able to perform at an, even at an adequate level as this goes on. And Bernier, you know, I wasn't impressed by what I saw, what he did the other night against the Kings either. Um, made too many mistakes, too many easy mistakes that could that'll get you burned and killed every single time. Um, other than that, yeah, it's practically, again, the, the Red Wings, they're at the same old spot they were at the last season, probably even a little bit worse. But, uh, you know, it's up to them to decide of, hey, you know, do we want to keep fiddling around in mediocrity or do we want to actually commit to a full blown rebuild? Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's time to tank again. Really. But, and, and that's no surprise, really. I, uh, I'm, I, I'm actually already, I'm already used to it. You know what I mean? So let's, yeah, let's just uh, leave it there and uh, see how how far how far down they go down the stretch later on the season twenty nineteen. So only one team left Before to cover. You continue, you know, I just want to give you a quick update. Uh, the Yankees have loaded the bases in the bottom of the ninth. It is one out, um, so they're down to their last couple of outs here uh, for the season. Craig Kimball's trying to end things here, but uh, he's in a real jam right now. 
Yeah, thanks for the reminder. And uh, by the way, about Jose Iglesias, he uh, posted on Instagram his farewell farewell from Detroit, um, which was uh, it, that that's what kind of sounded cryptic, kind of looked cryptic to me. Very. Yeah, and and because there was no reporting on again, there was no reporting on him being gone, whether they released him or he opted out of his contract or whatever. But yeah, bases loaded, one out, bottom nine. The Yankees have a chance to e- come back and even the series. But that being yeah, they got Neil, they got Neil Walker at the plate, so we'll see what he's going to do. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. Well, only one team left to cover. That being said, left side line three and he answers. The Pistons season preview. Dwayne Casey again. Trying to develop Andre Drummond, Blake Griffin, Stanley Johnson. We've heard it before. We've heard all that stuff before. I heard it on the same stuff on NBA TV. Um, but uh, the way I saw their preseason game at home against Brooklyn, they their defense did not show up much. Brook, Brooklyn showed better defense um, by blocking more shots than the Pistons have especially in the first half of the game. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the Pistons start at home at Little C's Arena against those Nets from Brooklyn at Little C's Arena Wednesday on the 17th at 7. That's the uh, just 90 minutes before we launch on the Staples Network. So we're going to give live updates on Nets and Pistons while we do our segments here. So, hey, we're talking about multitasking. while. Well, Remember, remember when you and I uh, did 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 uh, did a show on Blog Talk Radio and uh, uh, recap the uh, Tigers uh, blowing their six three lead in twenty fifteen when Jabba Chamberlain gave up that three run home run to Melky Cabrera tying the game at six and then obviously El Garcia the game winning RBI single. Yeah, I remember one of those things. I think I also remember doing. Uh you know, live capping a, uh, a Cardinals Tigers game with you at the same time, or something similar to that effect. Well, we well we also recapped a Royals Tigers game on a, on Sunday Night Baseball, where um, where you criticized Brad Aus- a lot of Brad Ausmus' Aus- mo- moves and non moves and whatever. Yeah, that was oof. that was definitely dark ages territory. Yep, absolutely. That that. But for the Pistons, you know, big, get it. Getting back on point with the Pistons here, um, it's worth noting to see that you saw Blake Griffin uh, trying more of, of expanding his, his three-point jump shot. You have to wonder when we'll see Andre Drummond doing more of the same. It's nice to know that he's still getting the rebound when he can get them, um, attacking the rim the rim very well. Um, you'll be able to see with Richie Jackson there, um, more than healthy, of how good the offense can potentially be. Um you want to see how the new additions like uh, Mike Sasa Pachulia, for instance, or like Henry Ellenson coming up from G League, can can he be that contributing factor that they expected him to be when Stan Van Gundy selected him? Uh, you know, just a lot of questions that uh, may not even be answered in full with the season, such as it is so with Dwayne Casey entering his first season. But, um, you know, if they, the Pistons do have one thing working for them. It is the fact that LeBron James is no longer in the Eastern Conference. So, that does open a spot potentially for another team to slip right on in or at least make the log jam a little bit more of a competitive shape to where um, you know, it'll be a tough spot for those, tough fight for, the last, for those last couple of spots. And if it's the Pistons, hey, good news, you make the playoffs. Bad news, probably get smoked in the first round by Boston or, or Toronto. Yep. After that Nets game in that season opener, they're at the Chicago Bulls Saturday on the 20th at 8 o'clock at at United Center. So, since it's just you and me tonight, why don't we get two segments in the way? First, five questions. Are you ready, Ed? Yep. Just like in the old days. Oh, yeah. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. 
Question number one, who will replace Mario and Pemba as Tigers play-by-play -play commentator on Fox Sports Detroit? Well, I think more than likely it's going to be Matt Shepard. Um, I say it is because Shep has done his fair share of calling Pistons games. I think he's even called some Red Wings games before. Of course, he's helped fill in, uh, you know, after the incident with, with Mario and Rod went down. He filled in. He and Kirk Gibson filled in quite well. Don't forget, uh, he's the voice of also, Michigan basketball. All right, the voice of Michigan basketball, who I think, what, at WFDN, they're a subsidiary of... Uh, yeah, WDFN, there's a subsidiary of that Fox Sports, you know, uh, branch or whatever, you know, it's, it's, you know, how, how FSD and WFDN are connected. WDFN. DFN, I'm sorry, I keep getting those, keep getting, I think I'm thinking of New York for some reason. Um, anyway, but with what Shepard has done also with calling Lions games, you know, he's been well connected with the, uh, Fox Sports Detroit brand for a while, so, um, more than likely, I think he'll be the one that would will replace Mario, and um, they'll still be doing. I think they'll still do the shifting of uh, different play-by-play -play guys because obviously with Kirk Gibson dealing with Parkinson's and other and other ailments that might be bothering him, it would uh, you know uh, be beneficial to him to not uh, move him around too much. So you guys switched up every now and then. But I think if you're going to ask me who's going to replace Mario, I say it will be Matt Shepard. By the way, it's it was four to two. Now it's four to three. Red Sox. Yeah, uh, there was a, a hit batter and then a sack fly. So now so the Yankees are down, down to their final out. Yep, but they got a man in scoring position to tie it up. And yep, who was that first, and, here? first and second, two out. Bottom nine, number twenty-five for the Yankees. Can't remember. Mm. D don't don't That's, know. It. That is... Craig Kimball's on the mound for Boston. But anyway... Next question. Question number two. Speaking of Kirk Gibson, if he wasn't willing to do color, anal color analysis full-time on FSD, who could? Um, again, I don't think it will be necessarily a full-time thing for him uh, or for anyone else, rather. They were doing the part-time system and in inter inter shifting, interchanging guys uh, for a couple years now before uh, Rod and Mario were fired, so I would suspect they'll be continuing the, 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 the same system they've been doing now. Bonus question. Who should Gibby, who could Gibby platoon it with? Speaking of platooning. Um, it'll be interesting here. Well, definitely not, to... definitely not Craig Monroe, please. He's only a stupid studio analyst, for God's sake. No, 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 no. No, Mar no, 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 Craig Monroe, absolutely not. Get rid of um, him, please. They may, they may do things, instances where you may switch up. Sometimes you'll see the radio guys in there. Like, you may see Jim Price in there with Matt Shepard. Or yeah, you might he, see... Jim Price is way too long Kirk in the tooth. Houston. Jim Price is way too so, long in the tooth. He can't He can't do TV He's, he's to, anymore. He, he used to do TV on what, what was what yeah, was past you know, sports. It, it, it is a possible scenario, so... yeah. Yep. So, on to question three. Next question. Question number three. How will the Michigan State Spartans end up through the end of the regular season? Um, repeat the question. It was, it was zoning in and out. Yep. How will the Michigan State Spartans end up through the end of the regular season? I think they're going to end up with... Red Sox win, uh, by the way. Yep, Red Sox just finished it off. It was a close play at first. They just finished it off. I think Michigan State, they're going to lose these next two more than likely. They'll give them five losses on the season. Seven and five. Don't they, face, don't they face Ohio State uh, also this year? So that's, what, six? Yeah, I, I, I would imagine they would have to face Ohio State anyway. So, yeah. So um, Yeah, so they could be six and six, maybe dare I say, five and seven, you know, for going to a middling bowl game. I think that's how I see their season of bending up, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, let, let me see here. I'm scrolling down. Saturday, November 10th against the Ohio State Buckeyes. Yeah. Yeah, two weeks before Michigan. Yep. They, they've got Nebraska. they got Rutgers. they got Maryland. 
three easy teams. Well, Maryland's almost easy, but on uh, Maryland, I, I, I will look out for that Maryland game. Be yeah. careful. Yep. Yeah. Purdue, Purdue, if they lost to Eastern Michigan, for God's sake. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say five and seven. I'll be Safe fair to say six and six. Okay. I think they can they can beat Maryland, but Ohio State's going to crush them. Yep. Fair enough. Next question. Question number four. Did Packers kicker Mason Crosby hand the Lions the football game? Again, remember the math that I did. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the fact that he missed those kicks, and a couple of them were very easy, makeable kicks. You know, and the fact that they just kept sailing or just... Uh, or hitting the, the, the upright or the crossbar, that was even more insane. So that just lets you know how completely weird that whole entire uh, game was from offense, defense, and special teams perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Mason Crosby is better than that. He's just getting long in the tooth. That's it. Yeah, that's all. It was just a bad game. Anybody can have a bad game no matter yes. how long you have. Yeah, no matter how long you play. Yeah, absolutely. And finally... Next question. What will the Pistons' record be, and is it enough for them to make the playoffs this upcoming season? You would have to imagine they, they will make the playoffs, just the record. Uh, right. I think record-wise, they could probably be around... If they get the 40 wins, it'll be a success. 40 wins will be my ceiling for them. 40 and 42. That would that would give you like a 7 or 8. Possibly. We know how weak the East is, so that may just do it. Yep. Absolutely. So, that wraps up our five-question segment. So, to our entire audience, if you want to answer those five questions, just replay that segment portion of this episode and answer them the best you can without going out of line. Now for the other segment. Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. Just the one event. Just the one doing that we have to grade. What's your grade on Dave Warner's play calling for Michigan State's offense? I'd grade it an F. Oh, this is easy F. And if I could, I'd go F minus minus. Yeah. Good God. <laughs> thought I would get, get I thought I would uh, give this a lot of extra bashing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Give me an F or he needs to be fired. Yeah. 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 So that's our What's Your Great segment. That didn't take long. So for our audience, if they have a grade for each event, for that one event, actually, post that in the comment bang in this episode, and please don't go out of line. Well, Ed, are you ready to launch next week? Oh, yeah. More than ready. More than looking forward to it. More than uh, appreciative. Thankful for going to the Stables Network, and can't wait to start this new step. Yep. And Jeff Moss, if you're listening right now, if you can hear us, we need you. Please. We want we want you to talk about Chris Sillich selling the Tigers and Red Wings, how it affects Little Caesars Arena, the and the disastrous Tigers start to their rebuild and Matt Patricia's uh, case, whatever the hell happened in that hotel room. Yeah. This will be a good twenty minute segment or my, or less. Just to be just to be fair. Jeff Moss wants, uh, I'm pretty sure Jeff Moss has done um, segments before with Ryan Schuling before. Remember that? Yeah, I definitely remember those before everything went south. Yeah, and we know why, but we're not going to mention that because that's that's off the format completely. Absolutely, it has, has no bearing here at all whatsoever. Yep. That being said, again, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast launching on the Stables Network next Wednesday, October 17th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Blog Talk Radio. Our special thanks go to Mark Mancini of the Stables Network for giving us a chance. Both of us will be live on the air on Blog Talk Radio. You can call in at 347-205-9631. We'll have, well, at least hopefully have Jeff Moss on as a frequent guest like Schuling used to do. 
And we want to remind everyone to share this episode, Meantime, and our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well because we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast is searching for a wider audience wider online audience that is fans of sports especially our teams in the state of michigan so please spread the word about the michigan sports truth podcast on spreaker soundcloud iHeartRadio, apple podcast via itunes google play on its podcast app and spotify as well as its verified facebook page the michigan sports truth podcast and its twitter periscope and instagram accounts at michigan underscore truth ed i'll talk to you next week on blog talk radio oh yeah looking forward to it bud yep all right so that is that i'm taylor phillips follow me on twitter and instagram at dt2 phillips and follow ed smith on twitter and instagram at ed smith 313 we'll talk to you next week on blog talk radio on mancini sports the saucy spin that's where you'll find us on blogtalkradio.com thanks very much for listening downloading and sharing stay smart michiganders ttfn ta-ta for now The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers. It only detects, exposes, and reveals honest, actual, and hidden truth, facts, and statistics about them. 